Any conversation about our amber soon turns towards the textile garments that it's famous for making. At other times, people who have heard of the community automatically associate it with its tradition of equality between the sexes, in domestic and other work, with men doing the cooking while women undertake jobs like farming with oxen, normally seen as men's work. But our amber nowadays is an amazing place that is home to a wide variety of manufacturing industries, as well as a large number of social and economic activities. That said, these diverse activities alone can't describe the essence and uniqueness that lies at the heart of this community. Located some 631 kilometres from the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa, 74 kilometres from the northwestern regional capital Baadar, and 12 kilometres from the district capital Waretta in South Gonda zone, and established in a locality called Aramba under the name of Aramba Society, this intentional community has many unique features that sets it apart from other such societies. Although similar to other communities that have sprung all over the world, based on the myriad of philosophies about the meaning of the human condition, its collective coexistence and its destiny, the Aramba intentional community is a unique movement. It has sprung into existence based on totally indigenous philosophies of enlightenment and renaissance, trying to give an answer to these age-old problems of the human condition. Among the most amazing dimension of these philosophical grounds on which the society is actually based is the realisation that the founders of the movement are ordinary poor peasants who had no opportunity to be educated and consequently can neither read nor write. Now, a community with several hundreds of members, the founder and leader of this movement is Mr Zumla, affectionately addressed by his supporters as Gash Zumla. To understand the true meaning of this movement and fathom the basis of all activities that take place in this community, it's important to know the history of the society and to comprehend the philosophical underpinnings on which the movement was founded on. It's impossible to make sense of the community without first understanding its philosophical foundations. Descended from Adam and mothered by Eve, we are all of the same blood and our bond should thrive. What is the origin of all this otherness? Let us purge this strangeness and live in togetherness. Our kith and kin is neither race nor colour. Being human alone can replace the other. <laughs> Hunger and poverty will never trouble me. All I need is my fellow man to keep me company. Death to the otherness and long live our brotherhood. We are children of one planet living in one world, rich in our diversity and together in our bond. With my eyes wide open and my ears fully attentive, your dignity is my pride and I swear to be protective. You shall come to no harm as long as I am alive. I lose my humanity if I deny your right to live. The authors of these proses are children born in our amber and who have grown up imbued with the transforming philosophy of Gash Zumra. So who is Zumra? The day and time of Zumra's birth is actually known with certainty. The year of his birth is approximately the year 1945 based on the Gregorian calendar. He was born on August 25th at 9 a.m. in the South Gondar zone in the county of Este in a locality called Yesho Michael to a family of peasants. He was the fourth consecutive son of his father Otto Nuru Muhammad and his mother Tyra Sakasa. As related to the members of the Ora Amba community by his mother Tyra Sakasa, who was alive until 1995 GC, Zumra started to walk at the age of six months. When he was two to three years old, he started to raise questions about things that he observed at home and in the houses of his neighbors. Eventually, the questions that he raised and the answers to these questions became the basis of the philosophy that Ora Amba Intentional Community was set up in 1972 European calendar. 
So what were these questions and why did Zumra raise them? I believe I was inspired by the Almighty. If it wasn't for God's grace, I wouldn't have overcome the many challenges I faced and succeeded. It all began at my parents' household. Especially the inequality I saw between my father and my mother. While both were indispensable and equally important for the family, there was no equality between them. My father used to behave like the master and my mother like a nanny to all of us, including my father. This made me think about gender equality. The other issue is what I observed about children's upbringing. From a very early age, children are assigned burdensome chores that don't consider their age. When they fail to do them, they face severe admonishment and beating. Why does such cruelty exist? Why don't adults consider the age of kids? To me, that was unfair. Third is what I witnessed around me regarding old people and those who were less fortunate due to illness and other reasons and couldn't support themselves. While the healthy, the able-bodied and the young are enjoying life, I see the less fortunate discarded. I asked myself who else will be concerned about these people if not us? It should be our human duty to help the less fortunate amongst ourselves. Fourth issue relates to human behaviors. I see and hear all types of evil acts being committed. I ask myself why people do cruel things to others that they wouldn't want others to do to them. If we are indifferent to the pain and suffering that our action causes others, we are no better than the animals we see as our inferior. To be human, we should show empathy to other human beings. There is also a fifth principle you have adopted in the latter years, removing partisanship in human affairs. What does it mean? We are all the children of Adam and Eve. Unless we claim there were many Adams and Eves, then we are all related to each other, and we are kins. This idea that we are different from each other because of our color is flawed. Human beings, just like sheep and goats, cannot choose their color. That is God's work. Just being human is good enough to treat others as a brother or a sister. Are you telling me? that the Americans, the Chinese, and the Japanese are our kins. Are they not human beings? Do you really believe that? Yes, indeed. It is this belief that estranged me from my parents. Then, let me ask you one thing that baffles me. You hold this strong view that the human race is one, that all of us are brothers and sisters, but here in Ethiopia, people ferment hatred on the basis of cultural, linguistic, religious, and ethnic differences people are killing each other. When you see this, what do you feel? As I told you what eventually led me to separate from the others is this view. I know that. What I am trying to get is a different matter. A war has been raging just 35 kilometers away from Urumba. You know the reason, a war fueled by ethnic hatred. Despite the vision, you have that can bring peace and love to humanity. What do you feel when you see your own fellow countrymen brutally killing each other? Is it sadness or what? That is why I raised my voice. So that people can listen to what I say. The world is not listening. In fact, the fire of hatred and division is spreading everywhere. It is humanity's formidable homework to extinguish the fire of hatred and bring love to all. The problem we face is intentionally created, and it can be stopped. My call is to end the beast of conflict. My brother, you came up with these noble ideas, convinced people to follow you and established such an idyllic community, but on the other hand, I am told you have no formal education and you can't either read or write. Is that so? Yes, that is true. Okay. What do you then feel when you see that such views of human empathy and brotherhood are alien to the well-educated? The issue has nothing to do with education. What I try to achieve is based on what I see and what I hear. I see the educated fermenting conflict. And I also see that all of them are not conflict merchants. I believe that out there we can find amongst educated people very kind, humane and empathetic personalities. I have been working hard to reach such people. I have been telling our community that it is a matter of time before the enlightened section of the educated community will listen to us. Whatever the challenges, we will never give up. 
Our vision will get acceptance and we will be witnesses when human beings eventually create heaven on earth and live in peace and harmony. Zumra and his colleagues established their movement and started to live their life and made these four philosophical tenets as their founding principles of their intentional society. By working very hard as tillers of the land, they were able to produce enough output to support themselves and other elderly poor in the community. As time went on, hostile groups opposed to their way of life and started to form in the surrounding community. Some people have been saying that if we say women are equal, we are going to lose the natural hierarchy and master-servant relation between the sexes. They also consider this notion of children's rights, making them equal to adults, as utter nonsense. They maintain that kids should eat what they are given and do what they are told to do without questioning it. When we tell people that we should support and care for the unfortunate because of age or disability, they retorted by saying they are not interested in looking after human trash. Our views were not palatable to the people around us. This became a source of conflict. When the youth of the area began to listen to us and join our community, they complained I was taking away their children from their families. There was nothing harmful we did to them. Yet, our neighborhood communities were bent on destroying us with all means possible, including political intrigue and machination. Even though the hostile forces started to get momentum, Zumra and his friends overcame all difficulties and continued to organize their movement. Eventually, the rumors that the neighboring hostile forces had started to circulate, which maliciously claimed that Zumra and his friends supported insurgent TPLF forces from the Tigray Liberation Movement that were active in the region gained momentum and caught the ears of the military regime that was fighting the insurgents and this created a great danger to their community. Zumra and other members of the movement realized the dangers to their existence and decided to abandon the area he had been born and grew up. He gathered a few of his members in 1988 and fled south to Banga in the province of Kaffa in the southwest of the country under the cover of darkness. The rest of the movement was forced to disband to save their lives while a few remained in the area. 7. The Intentional Community which had been given official recognition under the military government of the Derg as a peasant association in 1986 GC, was now disbanded. Ora Amba was covered in weed and foliage, and the heartbroken members disbanded. The land and belongings were now raided and taken over by the surrounding peasants. Eventually, after several years the military government was defeated at the hands of its enemies. Zumra and the rest of the movement that has survived together returned to the area and stayed with some peasants that were sympathetic to the movement. The new government allowed some of the land to be returned to the movement, but this proved to be insufficient for the members of the movement who had scattered and had now started to come together. It was at this time that Zumra convinced the group that the community could still be viable if it used whatever land it has to set up industries and merchandising activities that could support the community. He managed to set up a weaver's workshop shared his knowledge of weaving among the members and established a weaver's cooperative. They started to lead a life as weavers producing traditional garments and other textile products. This tried and tested community that has survived many trials and tribulations and had been condemned to extinction by the surrounding community has now re-established itself under firmer foundations and on a higher level of consciousness. By taking Zumra's philosophy as the foundation of their community, they have built an economic and social life that is full of peace and love. It has become a society which meets the basic necessities of life for its once poor peasant members such as food, shelter, clean water and clothing and now gives full cognizance to fundamental human needs such as education, health care and employment to all its members and beyond. This community with its more than 500 members and their families which give special care to children and the elderly, a community that has proved genuine equality of the sexes in practice, a community that has created mutual respect and cooperation between those with modern education and the peasant members of the community, that has resolved the age-old universal antagonism that has existed between private gain and collective effort, between individual and social wealth in the social and economic spheres, that has spread democratic norms in all aspects of the community's private and public life and increased public participation in civic life to a very high degree, 
that has wisely differentiated and harnessed the benefits of modernization and technical and other development while protecting itself from or denting its harmful impacts that has respected and protected the rights of individuals nurturing peace and love in its community that has protected nature and the environment from the harmful impacts of modernization and industrialization. This society called Aura Amba that has registered comprehensive victories on several fronts including making human beings and their welfare and rights at the center of every economic and social life and the institutions that they create. This society is going from strength to strength. Today the ideas and comprehensive developmental activities and practices of this community have reached a level where it could serve as a model to the rest of the country as well as the world. Among the five major principles of the community, one of them relates to the question of the role of children in our society. In our Amba, children are allowed to be what they are, children. They are the collective responsibility of the whole society as second in line to the family that they belong to. They need to be looked after with love and compassion. If they are given roles in the family and community in the social and economic sphere, such roles have to be commensurate with their capacity and needs. Children have rights, and that includes protection from violence and stress. Children need balanced times of study, work and play. Work shouldn't be based on the creation of value and extraction of value, but a mere introduction to the dignity of labour and the discipline that it requires. <laughs> Children should be assisted to acquire knowledge, notions of morality and good citizenship. Children shouldn't be undermined or abused because of their age and require the necessary respect. Hence, they are allowed to participate in the fortnightly discussion about the family under the title of Searching for Peace and are also allowed to lead discussions in the forum. Where they may need adult support to lead such discussions, such support should be given freely. <laughs> Mrs. Enanaya Kubret, Executive Officer of the Community Leading on Relations with External Bodies, stated this role in the following manner. We have 144 households. Every fortnight we have a family discussion session. Sometimes I may lead the session, sometimes my husband. Other times one of our kids could chair the meeting. We give kids the chance so they can exercise self-expression and leadership and they can teach us the parents. We believe it is not only us that can teach our kids, but they can also teach us too. Our Amba Intentional Community was founded by ordinary peasants who could neither read nor write. However, from the outset, it gave top priority to the pursuit of knowledge and to educating the future generation. Today, the members of the community have a well-organised kindergarten and preschool centre to cater for their young ones. Any parents who live in the area and who are not members of the community are able to send their children to this kindergarten if they so wish. Today, hundreds of new generation of youth educated in high school and with university degrees that are serving the community as well as the wider world outside it were once cared for and fortified by the civic and human-centred values of this kindergarten. 
As the community develops and progresses towards a prosperous future, the trend has been that its desire for peace among mankind, equality among its people and prosperity and a shared future for all is growing deeper. And this can be attributed in the main to the years spent in the positive environment during their preschool days. Ato Wodku Gebe Yehu, a member of the Our Amber community and a development economist and practitioner who until a few years ago lived and worked in the UK for several decades but has now made Our Amber his home, answered my questions about this amazing society and its economic and social organisation that has captivated the interest of many across the planet. We know the central philosophy of this community is making, intentionally, human beings the centre of all their activities. They work, produce, and live by loving and expressing solidarity by supporting each other. As a result, life, in comparison to the neighbourhood communities is a lot better here. There is no food insecurity. They all have modern amenities, including the internet. They have better education and health services. But some observers think the community will not last long. As they prosper further, and modernization is in full swing, cracks will appear and eventually collapse will follow. Do you think what some critics speculate could happen here? What do members say when faced with this question? Their reply is straightforward. Our lives have improved so much by relying on our vision. There were times when the challenges were almost impossible to cope with when we had nothing to eat but a salty soup made out of our cotton seeds we still persevered in our chosen path they say that if we had not succumbed then why should we now do so when we are comfortable and facing fewer challenges in fact we are further inspired by our achievements to march forward in my view the community had been in existence for over 50 years this means two generations the vision is so entrenched in the community. Their understanding of what they have achieved by adopting this vision is not superficial. Ideas have turned themselves into a material force. I don't think anything will undermine this community that easily. Responding to the questions that I put to Atul Werku, Atul Gebeyehu Desalo, one of the new generation of graduate MBAs, born and raised in Our Amba and now coordinating the committee that organises their 50th anniversary celebrations, had this to say. At the present, we have many highly educated youths. However, our community can create jobs only for a few of us. The rest are working outside the community and engaged in different professions. Be that as it may. All of them without exception are looking forward to the time when they could come back and live and work in their community. Even living and working outside has not changed them. There are about 30 of us who have been called back to serve our community when we finished our education and have returned, and we are serving with pleasure. We have not been adversely influenced by the world outside to doubt the visions of our community. Besides the kindergarten that imbues children with love for humanity and civic pride for all, Our Amber now has a primary and secondary school. This secondary school, called New Vision, was built on land that was donated by the community and funding which the community selflessly provided to cover more than 50% of its construction cost from its meagre earnings. The community demonstrated the importance that the education of the future generation occupies in their life priorities when it allocated 36% of the annual profits from its economic activity at a time when members didn't yet have enough to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. You can also see the deep sense of human solidarity in the community, reflected by the fact that only 60 of the students out of over a thousand enrolled in this secondary school actually originate from its members. This self-sacrifice has helped change the minds of many skeptics in the surrounding community about the nature of the intentional community. In addition to these three tiers of schooling that benefit the wider community, Our Amba has also built a library to serve the wider community as well as its members. The shelves of this library, as well as the seating, are made of mud and sticks, demonstrating that poverty could be overcome through innovation. Another area of its activity that demonstrates its sense of human solidarity is its care for the elderly and the infirm. 
at the opposite end to its earlier focus on children and infants. The philosophy of its care for the elderly is firmly based on one of its fundamental organising principles, that at the centre of everything that it does lies the welfare and rights of human beings. As stated by our Amber, the most important relations that humans have in the universe is that of the relations with fellow human beings. Having laboured all their life to care for their families and to build their community during their prime of youth, human beings shouldn't be cast aside as chattel when they reach old age, states one of the principles. The existence of this philosophy and practice means that when members reach old age, when they lose their prime and are no longer as strong when their health fails, they shouldn't have to worry about what happens to them tomorrow. The home for the elderly that you see here is made of materials that are all available locally. It's made of sticks and mud, and it has the capacity to accommodate 12 people. Another building nearby also has additional capacity. All the residents have their own separate space inside the home, portioned off from the communal areas. When they need to rest or require privacy, they close the curtain to the doorway and retire to their own space. When they need to socialise with their friends and housemates, they come out and sit in the communal area. To appreciate the quality of care that is given to these elderly members, one just needs to observe the standard of cleanliness and the general clean smell of the ambient space. The carers of the elderly in our amber are themselves members of the community, so the relationship that they have with their care home residents is one based on love and solidarity. The younger workers consider it an honour and a privilege to care for the people that once raised them with love and affection when they were young. Therefore, when anyone visits these care homes, they are bound to be surprised by the sheer cleanliness and pleasant smell of the place. It's also a pleasant surprise that those who receive care in this home for the elderly are not just members of the intentional community, but includes other people from the surrounding community who cannot find careers in their old age.